Welcome back to Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Hawaii, the state of clean energy. Um, and we are going to talk about uh, comparing Hawaii and comparing notes on clean energy around the country and the world. Uh, what should Hawaii know about what is going on? We have to stay, stay current on things that are happening. And for this discussion, we have Guillermo Sabatier. He joins us from Virginia, uh, and he is with HSI, and he is a host of a show that we call Perspectives in Energy, uh, which takes place uh, other times during the week. And we are delighted to have him here to be able to compare notes. Uh, welcome, Guillermo. Well, thank you, Jay, and I am delighted to be here. And thank you so much for the invitation. Uh, we haven't done a show together in a while, so it's certainly great to be back and at it again and do some dynamic duo. Yeah, so. yeah. <laughs> great, great to have you here. And it's also... You know, I want to say that your show, uh, Energy Perspectives, is really, really good. It's an important member of our lineup. It, it raises the bar. Thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. Thank, thank you for the platform and the opportunity. We really appreciate it. So, so how are we doing? When I say we, I mean, I, you know, I find that people use the word we very loosely. So when I say we, I always define it. How are we doing? That is the United States of America. How are we doing? Well, when you say we, it depends where you're where you are at in the country. Where are you geographically? Where are you regionally? And in what region? When I say region, meaning are you in the WEC, which is a Western Electric, are you in ERCOT, which is a Texas area, or are you in the Eastern Interconnection? So those are the major three uh, uh, interconnections. And funny enough, I think, and believe it or not, Texas is far ahead of everybody else when it comes to wind and solar and renewable energy. And oddly enough, you know, they don't export power outside of ERCOT. Or ERCOT really is most of Texas. Tell us what ERCOT is. ERCOT is the, uh, it is a reliability entity in Texas that encompasses Texas, a little bit outside of Texas. And really what it is, the most of these regions, whether it's the, uh, it's, it's the Eastern Connection, which takes from Florida all the way up to like parts of Canada and as far as west as the Midwest somewhere. Then there's WEC, which is a Western, uh, Electrical interconnection. That one is basically uh, everything west of the Midwest that, that excludes Texas, and that includes California, all of states, all the way up, up to Seattle, uh, Washington State, and a little bit of Canada. So, so those areas are are not interconnected with each other. They have what they call DC ties, where they they have a limited amount of uh, exchange where they can flow power back and forth. Uh, long ago, there was a project called the Three Amigas, the Three Friends that never, never quite made it, but they were going to interconnect all three regions together finally and make one giant region. And that would have been great, but it just never, uh, they, 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 I got started, but they just never quite really got underway. So I thought it was a singing, I thought it was a singing group, yeah. uh, <laughs> possibly a movie. <laughs> anyway, and it seems to me, is, isn't that where ultimately we're going to, we're going to have to go? You know, I, I'll tell you what, what makes me say that. I was uh, looking at our sound system here in the house, and I noticed something I never noticed before. And that is one of the various uh, resources for radio. Okay, I had a list of every radio station you could think of. So I started rolling through the list, and I realized on, on my cell phone, I realized that there were virtually hundreds and hundreds of radio stations captured um, on this program. And, and I realized that the country is bound together on radio stations. You can get any radio station anywhere on your cell phone. And, and so it seems to me that it's better for the country to be bound together on energy. Wouldn't it be the right thing to do, especially for you know nationwide energy security, to have these three regions connecting? Isn't, are we going there? Is there an initiative to make us go there? I don't think at this time there is. It, there was one at, at, at one point. There was a lot of uh, resources put poured into that, but it was tough to get all of that coordinated between WEC and the Eastern Interconnection and, and ERCOT. And and we shall see. I, it wouldn't be a bad idea to like look into that again and see how that would work. Uh, one of the main concerns that we have, I imagine, would be to have the adequate ties. And when I say ties, is those connection points, right? That you will need to formulate between those different areas, you know, east and west, and then ERCOT together, and it would require quite a bit of study. Would it be impossible? But it would require quite a bit of study, perhaps quite a bit of investment in additional lines, additional substations, the additional infrastructure to make that happen. Uh, but How about additional legislation. 
Now, possibly legislation, but really a lot of investment. And 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 you have to remember that a lot a lot of these like publicly owned utilities can't do it all on their own. A lot of them together working on these projects. And and usually when these large large uh, projects go on their way, there's like a shared ownership of a lot of them. Right? Where so uh, it, it, uh, there's 500 kV, 500,000 volt lines. 750, 750,000 volt lines likely will be the ones that will be used for that. That requires an extra type of, uh, of easement right away, real estate to build these lines, actually interconnect all that. So that's a likelihood. For example, just a footprint for that one site that never came to be, that Three Amigas uh, site was really, really like over like a square mile actually of, uh, or more of actual like substation equipment. So. So well, that was a sizable project that, you know, would have been great to have seen it function. But again, that would have been a problem because it would have been a single point failure when you think about it, right? Yeah, we you know I was thinking there's a downside to all of that. If, right. if, if some, a bad actor wanted to, um, you know, destroy our, our grid and our national resilience, um, if we had an integrated grid like that, a bad actor could, you know, destroy it all in one shot. If we had the different, mo different modes, modules around the country, it's more, more difficult. Well, it, it's it's interesting you say that because the as it is now within these different regions, right? You have uh, protection systems that are that that have schemes that will figure out a way to separate, depending on what happens. So I imagine they will do the same thing in that case. But the problem is, if you have one station that you're relying heavily on to 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 flow power through. It's only a matter of time before that area becomes congested, and then you limit how much power you can you can send through it one way or the other, and that's really one of the limiting factors in a lot of these cases, right? Mm. Um, ultimately, yeah. the idea is for reliability, so so each area can support each other, but at the same time, you also want to uh, the, the whole incentive behind that is not just reliability. You want to enter like a whole market option where you can buy and sell power from different regions, and then of course take advantage of the fact that you'll have different time zones, which means you have four or five hours of additional daylight or, you know, additional nighttime. And that, of course, spreads what they call that lighting peak or that morning peak load across the country. So that the whole idea about peak hours changes. And maybe, maybe that's a benefit to have it change and sweep across the country. You know, you, you spoke of uh, Texas, you know, and I remember that Texas got in trouble about not being uh, interacting with other states and with other grids in other states. And that when I asked you about you know what would legislation would be helpful, uh, I think I was thinking about Texas, because if Texas doesn't want to play, um, and we have this initiative, uh, we want to get Texas to play. We want every state to play, and that may require legislation. Uh, it may, but you have to remember also that the different states have to agree to actually get on board with this, and the states that are affected may not want to do it. The states that are at the actual borders may not want to do it. So, so it may require quite a larger con consensus, but really, what you're, the way to really do it is by really incentivizing it. What's the major incentive of, get, of getting this done? And a lot of times, Texas doesn't want to do it because then Texas, for example, has uh, they they don't want to be the actual entity where power flows through in or out, which is likely that that's what would happen, right? So you see power coming in from the east for the, the eastern connection through them it, it's whack. And that's one of the reasons I think that they they may have discussed in the past when they wanted to remain independent. Now they are connected, mind you. They are interconnected. They have what they call DC ties, and those DC ties, for example, are not affected by changes in frequency or different disturbances. So they're able to convert AC to DC, and then they're able to ship it through those lines, and they get converted on the other side. And maybe that's the that's the resource we need, right? More DC ties to interconnect our regions, and I think would be the nice little thread the needle type of solution that would work best in this particular case or for an incentive yeah yeah so what about what about the, how the industry is doing how the government is um you know interacting and uh, helping or not um and where we're focusing where the country or the th three three sections of the country are focusing on clean energy and could you also talk about um, the hijack a hijacking phenomenon that we see between government and industry. Well, glad you mentioned that because for a long time, whenever we talked about, um, and let me go further back, most utilities, when they want to deliver power to customers, they don't care how that power is generated. They want to have power that's reliable at a good price and safe. They don't care if it's, if it's 
if it's renewable, they don't care if it cares from coal, because if they are no generators, they just want to buy power and be able to deliver it to their customers, get those meters turning, and keep it reliably, right? And so they're really source agnostic. So the problem problem with a lot of renewables is that they're they're often touted as okay, this is clean, this is new, and they they give you we have this much capacity, but in reality, a capacity is not always guaranteed from day to day or hour to hour, and that's one of the challenges. So so uh, in a lot of cases, what would happen is you'd have a lot of activism that would drive policy, but then those policy makers were greatly influenced by these drivers, these activists, that a lot of times were not really stakeholders in the actual grid operation and grid design. They, for the, for a large part, and I've noticed this quite a few times, they really are out there to sell really over energy equipment, right? whether it's solar panels or wind farms, and to some extent even batteries. But the batteries are coming up uh, on demand as a solution to the problems that a lot of these renewables have caused. So whenever I see that whole CEO activism, right, I, I always want to ask a few things. Okay, so in their pitch, are they talking about reliability? If they don't once mention the word reliability, I usually that, that to me is a red flag. Because then and it, because they're not concerned with how their particular resource impacts the grid, right? Especially when you have a lot of solar or wind that cannot pivot quickly depending on what, what changes in demand or or they, they themselves can cannot control their output. Uh, the other issue that, that I always notice is is when they claim that their solution is the one solution that'll save everything. And rather than saying, hey, we're we are an important part of a bigger portfolio, right? And that's where the big difference lies, right? If they're trying to just sell you their their particular solution, then that's usually to be a suspect. And then and a lot of times I gotta tell you, it's it's not not that being an engineer is, you know, you're we're gods or anything, but there's something about STEM where you have somebody from the STEM field talking about how the grid works versus somebody that and we need them. They're, they're, they're very well versed on environmental sciences, but they don't exactly know how grid dynamics, grid physics actually operate. And a lot of times they're very passionate. They, they really believe in what they're doing, but they don't really get a good understanding of how these things tie together. And that's one of the things that, that, that for me, I think it's first, it's, it's separating these, these CEO activists that are trying to drive policy in for the wrong reasons. But then the second prong is to actually finally educate everybody who's not in the industry. So to give everybody the common language, the common understanding, so they can make better decisions. And we've had a few good examples of successes where we've managed to provide training to some of the aides and advisors for some of the uh, legislators. And whenever they get into some of these committees, uh, you see the ones that took the training, you see the ones that did it, and the ones that took the training are asking far better questions. At least people that are there trying to either push a policy for what's for the wrong reason, or they're there for a legitimate concern, and they want to get something done. So, training it out to be to be to be really efficient, you have to uh, coordinate the education, and uh, you have to coordinate the policy, and you have to have leadership. Call it energy leadership. On um, how do you do that on a national scale? Are we doing a good job? What what institutions and officers uh, uh, could do better? So in the industry of leisure utilities, you have the Department of Energy, you have uh, FERC, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, and then you have NERC, which is FERC has delegated uh, the North American Electric Reliability Corporation. And that, for example, NERC is, sets all the rules for the utilities. Now, mind you, a lot of that is peer is peer driven. So, so peers watch each other, but at the end of the day, NERC can fine you a million dollars per infraction per day if you don't follow the rules. And those rules are mainly driven for reliability, right? Re reliability is what they really go after. So so that NERC has that covered. NERC is there to make sure we don't black out, right? And the FERC has other policies that they, FERC has a lot of, uh, for example, market, not just reliability, but also a lot of market fairness. You know, like I explained it, right? It is a federal agency. That, that that the Department of Energy had delegated, for example, to operate in that capacity. Now, the Department of Energy, of course, looks at the utilities, but they also look at everything else as a whole, not just electricity and generation, but they look at everything else. So so there's different levels of government involved here. Um, one of the things I, 
I appreciate is the fact that they they they, they issued some pretty helpful legislation when it when it comes to driving certain initiatives and investments. Uh, one of the things I get concerned with sometimes, that I can see it is, is is I think they they've overcommitted on some of the solar and wind, and they haven't committed enough on uh, some of the hydrogen and some of the especially nuclear. Uh, we have not invested enough in nuclear, and even in this new uh, infrastructure bill, we we, so, we still haven't done enough. It was like 15 billion versus 80 or 90 billion, right? Nuclear versus solar and wind. So well, let's dwell on that for a minute. You know, I, we I would like to talk about the international uh, picture for a minute, sure. but but first, uh, you know, how how have we done in terms of developing a national portfolio that favors clean energy? Um, are we moving in the right direction, moving fast enough? Uh, uh, what what are we favoring, wind and solar? Is that it? Uh, you're right. I mean, we, we need to look at all kinds of alternatives, including nuclear. Um, and are we doing that, you know, sufficiently um, to uh, to build a future? Well, one of the main concerns that I've seen it, it's it's we're moving in a direction that I'm not sure it's. Yes, we're moving towards a carbon-free direction. Problem is, the way we're going there, I, I don't think it's often right. Uh, we are retiring a lot of base load generation that we still need for reliability. We're forcing early retirements on coal plants that we need to operate reliably. And then we're replacing that capacity with wind and solar. The problem with wind and solar is that the, they may say, you, you may have had a 100 megawatt coal plant replaced by a 100 megawatts of solar and wind, but you can't kill on that capacity to be available any time of the day, any season. And that's the main concern that we're seeing. And and and, and the batteries are not quite there yet. And one of the problems that I've noticed is the fact that there there's that's all driven by policy, which has been driven by the activism and by the CEO activism, which is concerning. So finally, we're at a stage where now the conversation of reliability and based on generation and even national security is finally part of you know, uh, the, the vernaculars in the conversation and the people that are that always been in charge of that particular part of the industry are now at the table, um, key stakeholders, whether it's the grid operators, you know, the engineers behind it, that then you know, the physics, all the ones finally, they, they're finally, uh, they've always been involved, but now they're actually at the table where they, where they help with the decision-making process for these projects. Now, where are we? Uh, we are definitely seeing some challenges when it comes to um, the amount of renewables on the grid, so much so that NERC, on the direction of FERC, has changed the threshold of all of these like solar facilities. So uh, for the longest time, there was a threshold of 75 megawatts or higher, or 100 K, uh, kV or higher. Uh, if you are if, if you cross either one of those thresholds or both, you're now subject to those steep NERC uh, regulations. And if you if you, if you you violate any of those, you can really pay a steep penalty for those, 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 those issues. So for the longest time, we saw facilities go up at 74.5, 74 megawatts. Uh, 70, and, and then, of course, they're, they're operating you know, under the radar because they were subject to that. What's happened recently is that they lowered that threshold from 75 to 20. Uh, nameplate rating of these devices, and then they lowered the voltage from 100 to like an ability to 60. So now that has really wrapped up a lot of different um, uh, independent facilities that were solar and wind that weren't part of it before. So now they're 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 worried about okay, so can we continue doing business this way? Well, if you're doing all the right things, you have nothing to worry about. But if you're if you're missing, you know. Uh, some of the things that Dirk requires, then you know, the, yeah, then you definitely have some work to do. So for that, they're even considering they want to stay in business, or they're 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 starting off these assets. So this may change, but the reason this all came about was because of all disturbances that these facilities are causing on the grid and really impacting reliability mm. to a greater degree. So 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 I, I'm glad the rules finally changed, and they're finally capturing the accurate cost of adding all, all of these different renewable resources onto the actual grid. But you know, uh, m maybe the most efficient uh, energy source of all is nuclear. And uh, as you mentioned before the show, there are still a, a number of nuclear reactors in the country generating electricity and uh, overseas too. Uh, and just despite uh, you know the, the the problem at Fukushima, um, and th and that there's a move to include these uh, small modular reactors. Uh, interestingly enough, some of them are made in Japan. 
Um, and so, that, you know, the question is that, is that, is that a, an active possibility? How do you feel about it? Well, I have been a proponent for a long time of small modular reactors. And what a small modular reactor is, is any, anything that's between five, 10 megawatts, all the way up to maybe a hundred megawatts, you know, roughly, and, and they vary. And these are small enough that they are the size of a 20 foot shipping container or a 40 foot shipping container. And they can be placed anywhere and they can run for, for decades. And then, and then when the fuel runs out, they just pull out the container, put in a new one. And that, that actual, the, the whole thing is contained, go somewhere else for processing. And they do something with that fuel with the, where they, they use it for another purpose, right? So it's not exactly waste that's stored away forever it's because the process is different. The actual reaction is also different. So it's not quite like, for example, these large nuclear facilities that we've all grown accustomed to seeing, those giant eyesores, right, that we see out there, it's no longer the same operation. It's not like a Chernobyl or Fukushima anymore. There's something quite small. Now, how far away are we? Um, there were quite a few companies that were here trying to get that done, and the like, new scale was one of them, and they, they had a setback where it, it's just a funding it's so expensive to bring it to, to bring it to fruition. So the Department of Energy, along with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, have gone ahead and gotten, gone, moved forward with standardizing a design. And why is that important is because if you standardize a design that everybody can use as optimal, at least in this country or at least in the Western world, it'll streamline the whole uh, supply chain issue because building the first one's expensive. But if you build the second one, it'll cost way less than the first one. And everyone else for that is a lot cheap. So right now there's one company in Sweden that is basically building these SMRs that I, they said they're about six to eight months away from going commercial with a whole fleet of them. And they are about, again, the same size we talked about, but this, this, they can deploy on barges. So these barges go out there and then, and then, you know, they, they're, they're trucked off and then they're, they're installed in place. And they are, they are like, can be left somewhere unattended because they're buried, right? They're secure, can't really get to them, and they have a perimeter to protect. But uh, and we may see a lot of those already. Uh, and, and this company, I think, did a lot of, like, maritime uh, proportion. And I just don't remember the name right now, but they, they're definitely a, a going to be one of the ones that are perhaps leading this effort. There's another company in Korea that's also building them, and another company in uh, in. It's Japan's got, I, I think it's like Mitsubishi's or what is actually working on it. And then of course we, we have one here as being worked on by Idaho National Labs and the Department of Energy. So. I've got a couple of, couple of reactions to what you said, you know, this could be revolutionary as far as the marine industry is concerned. I mean, we have reactors on U.S. carriers and all that and submarines, but uh, why not put reactors on, on large merchant marine ships? They could, they could go right. forever. On a single, you know, uh, a single dose of uh, uranium, and the other thing that comes to mind is is that um, the people we we spoke about a little while ago about the the, the industry members who would like to hijack uh, advances in favor of their own products, those guys, um, they would be uh, in opposition to nuclear, right? Nuclear is a highly political uh, initiative, and they would be on the opposition, wouldn't they? Well, they, they would often cite the, you know, the, the, the environmental risk that goes along with that without really understanding the difference in the technology, right? So right, right now they have like a, like a molten salt reactor, which on its own, it, 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 it's a passive control system. We that if anything fails, it'll just melt upon itself with the salt and then it'll contain itself. It's not, it's not like these other sites that require constant pumps and water and reactor cooling. So that right, so so you're absolutely right in that case, right? There will be detractors, and to that technology be you know be, being brought to a commercial level where it's all being used everywhere. But if we want to get to the point where we want to have reliable, affordable, clean energy, right? That that has a long stability. And nuclear is going to be an important part of that portfolio. And I must say, we can rely entirely on nuclear. We should, because remember, you still have to mine that ore, you have to refine it, and you have to find where those sources are at. So not every country that every uh, has that rich uranium source, right? So that's part of that partnership that goes along with the supply chain issue. But again, it'll be in it that will be completely replaced. I think fossil fuels to to, to that degree where we can replace them, you know, uh, megawatt for megawatt and have 
the same type of like dispatchable reliability it is. So all that considered, Guillermo, uh, how how are we, again, this time I mean the national economy, the national industry, uh, how are we doing as against Europe uh, and against Asia? Okay, so right now we're still a little behind France in nuclear, right? France has been ahead, ahead of the game in nuclear. Uh, and you, you could tell how well they did during this whole Ukraine-Russia conflict, right, compared to Germany. Germany shut off all its coal, most of its coal, and then they shut off like all its nuclear. And then when things went what went south, they had to restart some of their coal, right? Whereas France, uh, for them, it was pretty much. I mean, they had their issue with Africa because that's where they source a lot of their uranium ore. But for them, it's like they basically almost almost business as usual. In fact, they were selling power to Germany and the rest of Europe. So, so, so in that respect, will be like um, Korea, for example, has. Pretty uh, developed this nuclear technology pretty well. China has made a lot of investments in nuclear. Um, they're, they're definitely, uh, I'm not sure they're ahead of us that far, but they definitely have uh, so, some advantages over us where they, they, they've explored different avenues. And then, of course, Russia uh, has quite a bit of like uh, refined uh, nuclear fuel in, in their stores. So, a lot of like, for example, the nuclear energy industry really relies on Russian stores. Of uh, so that's another challenge that we see. For us, we are a little bit behind, and and uh, I'm not going to sure record it. We have some work to do, and um, I think we got let me to... let me turn to Hawaii for a minute, because sure. uh, you know a bit, for a long time, for at least a decade, um, we were uh, saying and maybe deluding ourselves into thinking that Hawaii was a leader in clean energy, mm-hmm. and we had a lot of solar and we had some wind. I'm not sure our wind is kept up with the solar because of the NIMBY problem, and we have limited areas of land and so forth. Um, And and then there was this uh, conference maybe five years ago uh, where LNG was in play, and Nextera was was trying to merge up with uh, Hawaiian Electric, and it was talking about uh, LNG as the bridge fuel of choice to move from fossil fuels to clean energy. Um, and and uh, Governor David Ike appeared at that conference uh, without any preliminaries, and he said, A, I oppose next year's acquisition or merger, and B, I oppose LNG. Well, <clears throat> that, he's a powerful guy as the governor, and P.S., uh, there was no merger, and P.S., there was no LNG. Um, was he right? Um, sh- shouldn't we have done the next era deal? Seemed to me a very positive deal. Good for Hawaii. Next year is a very good company. Uh, tell me if you agree or disagree with all this. And LNG would have been a good and manageable bridge fuel. What do you think? Well, I have to agree with the fact that the yeah, LNG would have been a great manageable bridge fuel, especially given the portfolio of energy, right? And, and the 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 really important asset, capital asset that that Next Era Energy would have brought to the islands would have been the uh, submarine cable. I mean, because that brings you reliability, right? You're able to interconnect everybody together. You, you, uh, in fact, uh, you have the ability to then uh, have generation sites away from your urban centers or from your from, from from your natural wonders, really, and and then you can actually move that power or uh, anywhere you need it at the islands. So, so two two different things, right? So then, energy would, would have been a great bridge fuel. It creates a lot less emissions than diesel bunker C fuel because I, I I know some of your facilities burn bunker C fuel or oil and it's very dirty fuel right so replace it with that and you would have been a lot better off as a transitional. Uh, the other issue of course is that you you have the capability for a lot of like uh, geothermal on the island as well. So that that's another resource that that yet remains untapped. But in in order to make that um, a, a viable project, you would need those other C cables to be able to interconnect them. And the reliability means, of course, you have a lot less outages, uh, and then everything functions better. Cost goes down, and even to some degree, for example, you uh, it, it's so there's there's different standards, right, for vegetation management when you have a, when you have that sort of infrastructure in place. So uh, trees being trimmed by a certain clearance by certain transmission lines are regulated by, by NERC. Whereas, for example, distribution, which I think some of the some of the fires you had in the island recently, 
a lot of those distribution fires, for example, there, there's there's that could have been improved by that sort of interconnection in there because of the fact that you would have been able to feed it from, from another side and it wouldn't be a radial feed with a lot of these distribution circuits that are impacted by these fires. So 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 yeah, it's it's a real shame that that that, that deal just didn't go through. Um I used to work for Nextera um, years ago, and I, I was part of some of the studies. And I can tell you that th there was a they they really want want to make Hawaii uh, a shining example of what what could be possible. And it's a shame that you know and that it didn't happen. So I I agree, uh, and I agree with you about the cable. You know, to me, the cable would have put all the islands on a, on a, on, a, on a better footing. It would have reduced cost in some of the neighbor islands, which where costs are forty or fifty cents a kilowatt hour. Yep. Which is really, you know, that that is the kind of thing that constrains an economy is what it does. Absolutely. Um, one other thing, <clears throat> and I and I would go for uh, I would go for the, um, you know, the camel for for all the islands. And unfortunately, um, because it was so political, and people were opposing it, and some of those activists were opposing it, and some of them were corporate activists, just as you described. Um, you know, it's radioactive. I don't mean that term in terms of energy. It's politically radioactive, and so uh -huh. it's not coming <laughs> not coming back anytime. So, but you know, from this discussion here, well, it seems to me that Hawaii should be very interested in the in the modular uh, the modular nuclear system, and I wonder how that would work here because you know people would oppose a large nuclear plant such as you see driving down the road in, in France. You know, see these huge plants. And they're great, and they and they haven't had incidents or anything. They've been they've been fine for France, um, but query whether people here would tolerate it because we have small, limited land. Uh, so the modular would be very appealing. How would you deploy that system in Hawaii? So these uh, that's a great question. So these systems, uh, going back to the regulatory requirements in Hawaii, I think they're written into your laws where you can't store you can't store waste. And they have to have a certain other requirement that I think these modular reactors address at the same time. So one is the whole thing can be pulled out and re removed and taken somewhere else. And the other one is there has to be like a certain size limitation or a certain aspect of the way it's set up where by the nature of the actual uh, container itself, right, that also addresses that issue. So so uh, the way that would be deployed, I think it's really these SMRs would be deployed best in like the, the more remote communities. And that anywhere you need, for example, a source, right? Uh, that's where you could have it by every substation. You could have it there because don't forget, not only are you providing power, you're also supporting voltage, you're supporting frequency. And that is just as important as power. Uh, you have a voltage side, you can destroy equipment. So whether you do it on the transmission side, which is the high voltage equipment, or you do it on the distribution side, uh, that all depends on what you need. And in a lot of these items, right, you it's they can easily deploy those on the distribution side to get, for example, that a customer at the end of the line some power, and then they begin to feed power back. Like if you had like a separate little a power plant at the end of that. Um, the other interesting aspect of that really is 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 SMRs. Would, will solve a, a huge problem in the item when it comes to generating base generation that's dispatchable by the utilities, right? But at the same time, is uh, e everybody's throwing rooftop solar on all their houses, I'm sure. But nobody's putting in storage. Nobody's buying a little battery bank. Nobody's getting a Tesla. And, and that's the other thing I think that will be a critical go from a consumer to a, to a prosumer, where you're producing power, but you're also storing it. And the way I see it is is that is SMRs on one side, and then on the customer side, you have, for example, distributor energy resources, DERs. That is going to be the answer to a lot of the problems where the actual customer themselves are working in partnership with the utility and even getting paid by the utility to be just be available for dispatch, which you know will make them money and the utility saves money by not having to build so much infrastructure. So that would be your well, to mark solution there. So. Just looking at our conversation here, which I find very, very valuable, um, it seems to me that uh, to the extent that Hawaii was uh, excited about clean energy 10 or 15 years ago, it's not as excited anymore. Um, it's not as excited, for example, about electric vehicles. Mm -hmm. There used to be a state uh, you know, incentive, a, uh, you know, a credit. Um, that's no more and hasn't been resurrected. Um, and so, you know, you don't have the same kind of... Uh, the government loves this kind of feeling about it. 
and uh, and then at the same time, you know, the the of course the national effort is is, is largely political, um, but it, it's moving somewhere, and it, it has the ability to move in large strokes, conceivably. Um, and the U.S. is maybe a little behind uh, Europe and Asia, just uh, the way things work. Um, but Hawaii, it seems to me, you could argue, is behind the mainland. Um, and with all of that, if Hawaii, well, for that matter, the we, meaning the national clean energy effort, uh, don't, don't move ahead quickly enough, what happens? What happens to energy? What happens to our communities? What happens to our economy? Um, how, how, how substantial, how emergent is the pressure to move ahead with clean energy? But it is certainly a, we we can't keep on business as usual, right? The problem is that 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 there's other nations out there that are weaponizing this environment against our enemies or against our adversaries are, and and some of them are weaponizing it. Others are just they just don't care because, for example, you have emerging economies that are just burning fossil fuels. Right? I mean, for for every um, plant coal plant in the mainland that we shut down, I think there's four or five of brand new ones that sprung up in Latin America and China. So, and, and a lot of them are in Latin America. So, so uh, it's, you're acting locally to help a global problem, but you just can't do it by yourself, right? So, so yeah, it's very important, but the whole world really ha has to like take part in this. And the problem being is that, is that, you know, is it, are we damming up rivers or are we just burning coal? Do you know, we wouldn't know when. But in uh, places like Hawaii, for example, right, you can still make a difference by making it clean, but also making it like reliable, sustainable, and economic. And SMRs really, I, I think, are are a perfect solution to that particular environment. A little bit of hydro as well. You have the you have the facility to be able to make some pump storage hydro sites and some of your geothermal. But in reality, it, it's it's a some point you may need to use. Some of those submarine cables, but if there's resistance to that, then I think you can get away with not using cables if you have those SLRs in the right places. Because mind you, they're small, and you can just deploy what you need in small locations. It's just a matter of having them there when they're available, and then of course getting approval to have them there. Because now you're talking about nuclear is a little bit different, but they're so small that who knows how that would work regarding legislation or even if it can get around current laws. So, but again, you got to worry with the detractors and how they'll try to stop that. So. Yeah. And that's leadership back to leadership, yeah. but there's no room for complacency here. We have to keep on moving forward. If we want our society to work well and our economy to work well, uh, and we have to follow the technology and, and find and use and deploy the technology. All of what you've said is really resonant for me. Well, thank you very much, Guillermo. Guillermo Sabatier of HSI in Virginia, uh, who has been uh, the host of our Energy Perspective show for quite some time. And we really appreciate you coming on Hawaii, the state of clean energy here on a Wednesday. And we really appreciate your thoughts. Well, we really appreciate being here. And thank you again for inviting me as a guest. It's always fun to work with you, Jay. And uh, it's, uh, it's, it's been a fun show today. The same. Let's do it again. I'm sure will. <laughs> Thank you, Guillermo. Aloha. Aloha.